1934, the world was gripped by economic depression, a depression that had started with the Wall Street crash in 1929. Adolf Hitler's rise to power under the slogan Arbeit und Brot, Work and Bread, had led to him being elected Chancellor of Germany in 1933, before assuming the role of Führer in 1934. American President Woodrow Wilson's idea of a League of Nations to keep peace following the Great War of 1914 to 1918 was failing, and extreme beliefs were prospering across Europe. Into a melting pot of tension and uncertainty, the second ever edition of the FIFA World Cup was due to take place. Italy were led by fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, and his policy surrounded the cult of personality. Il Duce, as he was known, prioritised being seen as the perfect man and perfect leader, done through both propaganda and force. With plans of Italian expansion in mind, a war of revenge in Africa with Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, would follow in 1935. Part of Mussolini's methods of winning support and public approval were through the promotion of sport. Il Duce was a keen follower of football and an active sportsman himself. The chance to host a World Cup in 1934 was the ideal opportunity to magnify Italy on a grand stage. A mass propaganda campaign followed in Italy, with posters, stamps, cigarette cards and anything else promotional available used to ensure that Italy would be glorified through this feast of football. A major role in this cult of personality was sport, because Mussolini saw it as a means of expressing fascism's demand for individual dedication to the greater collective need. His order to all competitors who represented Italy was, remember, when you compete abroad, the honour and sporting prestige of the nation is entrusted to your muscles and above all, your spirit. Much greater than playing abroad, these Italian footballers had the daunting honour of standing for their country on home soil. The World Cup would take place from the 27th of May to the 10th of June 1934, with 16 nations joining from four different continents. The tournament was hosted across eight different host cities, from Naples in the south to Milan in the north, as thousands of football fans from across Europe travelled to Italy to enjoy the fortnight of competition. This would also be the first international football competition to be broadcast on live radio, the action sent to listeners in 12 of the competing nations. However, current World Cup holders, Uruguay, refused to take part in the proceedings as a form of protest against the nations who did not travel to their own tournament four years previous. Uruguay were also joined in the boycott by the four home nations, meaning no British representation would be present. The English FA were particularly vocal about their disapproval of the FIFA World Cup. They firmly believed that they, the FA, had founded modern football in 1863, and therefore any usurpers were not worth their time nor attention. Charles Sutcliffe, one of the FA's notable administrators in the 1930s despised FIFA and believed that their system of giving each association an equal vote magnified the midgets. Sutcliffe branded the 1934 edition of the World Cup a joke, believing that the home nation's championship was the tournament that truly declared who were world champions. This would not bother the Italian dictator Mussolini though. The lack of English presence, as well as Uruguay, allowing for Italy's route to the final to be simplified. The 1934 World Cup would be structured as a straight knockout tournament, with eight seeded teams, based upon the FIFA rankings, avoiding each other in the first round of competition. Argentina, Austria, Brazil, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Hungary, Italy and the Netherlands. These first round ties would all kick off simultaneously, and plenty of surprise was provided in the first couple of fixtures. Spain saw off Brazil 3-1 thanks to a double from Athletic Bilbao's inside forward Jose Iraragori, while Switzerland dispatched the Netherlands in the San Siro Milan by three goals to two. 1930 finalists Argentina were hit by a dispute not unlike those common in Argentinian international football today. This meant that not a single member of their squad who reached the final four years previously would feature for the South Americans as they were defeated by the Swedes 3-2. Italy won the 
Italy were pre-tournament favourites and started in a rich vein of form, destroying USA 7-1 in front of Mussolini, who had made a big scene of queuing with the general public to purchase his own ticket. Angelo Schiavio, Bologna legend and future Italian manager, netted a hat-trick, whilst Giovanni Ferrari, one of the greatest Italian footballers in the 1920s and 1930s, also got himself on the score sheet. The victory for Italy set up a fiery tie with the Spanish in the quarter-finals, a tie that would have to go to a replay, but also saw both sides pick up a number of injuries due to the brutality of the contest. After drawing 1-1 in Florence, Ferrari again netted for the hosts, it would take a strike from Inter Milan hero Giuseppe Miazza to secure the 1-0 win a day later and a place for Italy in the semi-finals. The quarter-finals were made up of solely European teams, the only time in World Cup history where the final eight has been from one continent. Joining Italy in the semis were Austria, who had seen off their old friends and rivals Hungary 2-1, Germany, who had defeated Sweden 2-1, and also Czechoslovakia, who had firstly beaten Romania before sending Switzerland home with a 3-2 win thanks to a late strike from their talismanic inside forward, Aldrich Neardley. The semi-final draw saw Italy face off against the strong Austrian side who featured Matthias Sindler, known as the Mozart of football and likened to a pre-war Pele. The Azzurri were resolute in the semis, putting on a classic Italian defensive display to hold firm against the Austrians and seize a 1-0 victory. Argentinian forward Enrique Guaita, who plied his trade for Roma, scored the only goal for Italy in the 19th minute of proceedings, securing Italy a shot at glory on the 10th of June 1934. In the second semi-final, controversy was abound, as Italian referee Ronaldo Balassina would be accused of bias. With Czechoslovakia, who were the less fancied side, versus Germany, some believed Balassina helped tip the tide towards Czechoslovakia to give the Italians the best shot at lifting the trophy. Despite any bias that may or may not have existed that day, it would be Ulrich Neerdli who would steal the headlines for his nation. A hat-trick blasted the Czechs through. 3-1 winners. Neerdli's goals had secured him the golden boot, an award for five strikes across the tournament. The final was sorted then. Hosts Italy would line up for their shot at glory in Rome, the home of the Great Colosseum, the home of the Roman gladiators, and in 1934, the home of the Fascist Party Stadium. 55,000 spectators would be packed into the arena on the 10th of June to watch Italy in blue versus Czechoslovakia in red for the title of world champions. Mussolini's desire to show off his own country saw him commission an extra cup the Coppa del Duce, whose dimensions dwarf the real thing. Czechoslovakia's short passing game and the boots of Neerdli certainly had the potential to trouble the Italians, and for the first half, the scores remained 0-0. With just under 20 minutes remaining, Mussolini's fascist World Cup party was almost derailed as Czechoslovakia opened the scoring. Prolific outside right Antonin Puch of Slavia Prague found the back of the net, and the Czechs had a shock lead. However, with just nine minutes left on the clock, it would be Juventus's Mirmo Orsi who levelled the game. The South American-born Orsi rescued the game and sent the match into 30 minutes of extra time. Five minutes into the extra 30, Miazza picked up the ball out wide and crossed it in to semi-final goalscorer Guaita. Guaita played the ball to the feet of teammate Schiavone, and he found the back of the net for the fourth time that summer. Italy held on, and manager Vittorio Pozzo led his men to the top of the World Cup podium. A rapturous party broke out as the Jules Rimet trophy was presented to the victors, as well as Mussolini's giant Coppa del Duce. The reaction in Britain to Italy lifting the trophy was markedly quiet. The Bristol Western Daily Press just gave a six-lined corner of the paper dedicated to the final. It only mentioned the scoreline in Rome, not even allowing credit for the goal scorers themselves. The Tamworth Herald, meanwhile, was even more succinct in its reporting of Italy's victory some six days after the event. Two and a half measly lines that didn't even include the score. The attitude of the British was set to be maintained until after the Second World War, 
British teams refusing to participate on the global stage. However, in November 1934, England and Italy would get the chance to slug it out on English soil. The Battle of Highbury was known in the British media as the real world championships, as the FIFA World Cup holders, Italy, faced off against the originators of the game, the forever great England. The Guardian reported that it was not a game of football, but it was a battle, and England held on to win 3-2 at Highbury, an event that would further purport the story that England were truly undisputed world champions. It is impossible to view this World Cup without considering the European context at the time. Just days later, a jubilant Benito Mussolini would travel to Venice for a historic meeting with German Chancellor Adolf Hitler, whose Germany had earned a third place finish in Italy. Hitler and Mussolini agreed to support each other, a decision that would lead to the beginning of the Axis powers. Just a fortnight or so later, Hitler would order the Night of the Long Knives, where high-profile political enemies and some friends too would be executed. For Mussolini, the success of a World Cup victory for the sports-mad Duce would help solidify his role in public office. The next four years would see the situation in continental Europe deteriorate, meaning that when the next World Cup was hosted in France, the world would be on the brink of war. We hope you enjoyed another edition of our audio blogs. Please make sure you check out our book, Football's 50 Most Important Moments, and subscribe to our channel too.